Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Caitlin Goodman. Um, I'm a member of PAC Skulls Program and Member Engagement Committee. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and welcome to the first in a series of programs which will highlight issues facing special collections when disasters, small or large, Today, we will discuss how to create relationships and work with the people we rely on most to ensure that our collections survive, building managers. Everyone has been muted upon arrival, and we'll have plenty of time at the end of the program for a Q&A. You'll be able to post your questions in the chat, or you can raise your hand and you'll be called upon by one of the moderators. Lastly, this meeting is being recorded and will be added to PAC School's YouTube channel. And so I'm going to introduce all three of our presenters now, and then we'll get started with the programming. Uh, first up will be Lynn Dorwalt. She is the Special Collections Librarian at the Wagner Free Institute of Science and is also the treasurer for Paxcol. Lynn works closely with the Wagner Site on disaster preparedness. She presented on working with first responders at Paxcol's annual general meeting in 2022. Next up, Jordan Landis the curator of the Friends Historical Library of Swarthmore College, overseeing the operations of a library focused on the history of the Religious Society of Friends, also known as Quakers. And finally, we will have Amy McCall. Amy is the Associate Director for Collection Management and Discovery at Swarthmore College Libraries, and one of her areas of responsibility involves serving as the curator of the Rare Book Room. In the past, she worked in the Paxcol Central Office during the Pew Charitable Trust's initiative for the 1990s project, managing the Name Authority Funnel pro Project. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Lynn. Thank you so much. All right. Hi, everyone. I am going to share my screen. All right, um, so for a, a little bit of background about the Wagner, for those of you who are not familiar with us, the Wagner Free Institute of Science is an educational institution and natural history museum founded in 1855 to provide free science education to all people. The National Historic Landmark Building designed by John MacArthur Jr opened in 1865 and has operated continuously in support of this mission. The Wagner is a rare surviving 19th century natural history museum whose building collections, exhibits, library, and archives are nearly unchanged since the early 20th century. Um, <clears throat> and what you're looking at right now is the Wagner's museum. It's the second floor of the building. It occupies the entire second floor and the two gallery levels above it. And this is a view of the building and the grounds. And so now I'm gonna tell you a little story of a disaster that we had at the Wagner. On Sunday, February 14th, 2009, Happy Valentine's Day to the Wagner. Uh, Mid-morning, the Wagner's executive director, assistant director, and site manager received a call from our monitoring service that an alarm had been received and that a fire department had been dispatched. The site manager was the first person to arrive, and this is his description of the scene when he arrived. Thick black smoke was pouring out of the wide open front doors. The alarm bells were deafening. The power was off and the building dark. Inside, thick smoke had filled the main hall as firefighters with flashlights moved deliberately throughout the dark building checking for fire. This was February and it was cold and the Wagner's heat came from a single oil fired boiler installed in the basement in the late 1950s. Oil had leaked onto the floor and caught fire. Flames had reached the underside of the joists and wood floor overhead, charring their surface. The fire was put out with chemical extinguishers, not water, and luckily was contained to the basement. Um, 
While the site manager was with the firefighters in the basement, the director and assistant director had arrived and were upstairs managing our response. They were briefed by the firefighter in charge, and then calls were made to notify our insurance company and contractors needed to secure the building and restore services that were cut off by the firefighters. They also alerted the board president and other key staff and consultants who, who would play a role in recovery and communications. Since we were closed for the weekend, the building was empty when the firefighters arrived. To gain entry, the firefighters had to cut padlocks on window security gates and opened windows instead of breaking them. Locked doors were forced open, but with pressure and not fire axes or power saws. Once the fire had been extinguished, windows and doors to the outside were opened, not broken, to vent the smoke. The fire department saved us from disaster. Not only did they respond to the alarm incredibly fast, but they carried out their mission with sensitivity and care for our historic building. We credit their sensitive response in parts to efforts we had made previously. At the time, we were in the process of developing a disaster plan. As part of that planning, we developed a first responders handbook designed primarily for members of the police and fire departments. It also served to organize and create a plan for our staff in a crisis. Um, and here you can see uh, our poor deceased boiler that left us with no heat in February. <laughs> um, The creation of the Wagner's first responders kit came out of our site manager's involvement with city-led disaster preparedness and response programs and the Philadelphia Alliance for Response. Our first responders handbook had three primary goals, to give a quick visual guide to navigating with inside the building, a visual guide to the location of key features like the alarm panel and emergency utility shutoffs and a brief guide to the institution and key staff. We wanted them to know in advance what they, that they would be entering a historically significant building filled with flammable materials, including wood flooring and furniture, books and papers, and many, many taxidermied specimens. Site visits were held for local police station and fire departments. Copies of the handbook were passed out and explained during full tours of the building and grounds. All Wagner senior staff and department heads were issued copies to keep at home. The handbook and our outreach preparations helped save our building and minimize the damage from what could have been a catastrophe. Firefighters told the director that the site visit and the handbook was key to their ability to rapidly contain the fire and minimize damage. Um, and I will stress this multiple times, um, doing the site visit with your local first responders is probably the most important thing that you can do. Um, so what goes in a first responders kit? Um, this um, is very individual to your institution. Um, it really is what you're handing first responders to orient them to your space, your collections, anything they need to know to respond to a disaster in your space. Um, so I'm going to go through our first responders kit, but yours will be different. And so these are some things to consider um, when you're compiling a kit. Uh, what is access to your building like when you're closed? Uh, what do first responders need to know to get into your building? What do they need to know if you're open? How many people might be in the building? Who are these people? Staff, children, visitors, um, special things about the makeup of your, of your building? Um, what, what is it constructed out of? Where are the utilities, alarms, hazardous materials? What's important? What should be saved first? 
What should they most be aware of and what staff will they be dealing with? Uh, so for the Wagner, we did a lot with maps. Um, our building can be kind of confusing to navigate if you've never been in it before, which is yet another reason why it's very important to do site visits uh, with your first responders. Um, so we made maps of how to get in and out of the building. Um, the um, utilities, alarms, where things are located, and then a lot about what we are and uh, who is here. So the building construction, we really wanted them to know this entire site is special. It's unique. It's a National Historic Landmark. There isn't one part of it that is more important than the other. Uh, this entire site in its totality with its collections is what the Wagner is. So we tried to describe that in a very basic way. Um, so, you know, they can see right away that the entire makeup is brick and wood. Everything inside of it is basically flammable. Um, and then a bit about our utilities and alarm system. Then a little bit about who we are and who is here in this building. And that's important because we do have uh, lots and lots of school groups. So if there is an emergency while we are open, first responders need to know that there will be a lot of children around. Um, and that we also have a very small staff. So there's only going to be seven, at the most, seven people here who are actual staff members of the Wagner. And now I'm going to switch. Oops. Two different. I'm going to show you some maps. All right, so um, this is a map of the entrances and exits of the Wagner, and it seats the Wagner in within the grounds of the entire site. Um, and you can see here, um, Oops, sorry, hang on a second. <laughs> All right. Um, here is the notation. This is the window that the firefighters use to get into the building. Um, they knew that they could cut the padlock and easily open a window and get in without having to break anything. Um, <clears throat> a way to get into the basement and a fire escape. And um, the importance of this map is they mainly for when no one is in the building. So they need to know how to get in. Um, and this definitely depends on um, how your site is managed when, they, when you aren't open to the public. Um, other places might have security staff that are there 24 hours, so they would need to be brought into the discussion and be the first contact with first responders. Um, I also, in my research, uh, read that some places, depending on their alarm system or, or way to get into the buildings, have special uh, keypad entry for first responders so that they do have a way to get into the building. <clears throat> uh, this shows our alarm and um, furnace shut off. And then this is our basement. 
So it shows the gas and the electrical panels and how to shut them off and our boilers. Another important thing to point out is uh, any hazardous materials you have stored in the building and where they are. There's a, a whole map that shows where those are. It's also important to have a list of what those are uh, so firefighters know what they could potentially be dealing with. Um, and then we have a set of maps called sensitive areas, which I'm not exactly a fan of that title, um, but we haven't come up with a better one yet. But this pinpoints areas within the building that are extra special for different reasons. <clears throat> this one shows the library and archives and administrative records areas of the building. Um, and this map can also inform uh, first responders of what's important to save before anything else. If you have certain things in your collection, in your building that you want to make sure get out of the building in an emergency, this would be one way to do it. Uh, the Wagner uh, has made a, an internal decision that there is not any specific things that should be saved. Um, there's not one thing that's more important than another. It's the site as it, its entirety. Um, but a lot of places have extra valuable things that they want hold for various reasons. Um, and I read certain ways to do that. <clears throat> Places do make, excuse me, <clears throat> color code in maps and then color code within their collections what should be pulled. Um, I've seen um, people for this and other places against it. Um, some saying that this just provides a lift list for theft. Um, but I just thought I would uh, pass that on to you. Um, and then finally, um, our other sensitive area is the entire museum. Um, and it lists taxidermy specimens. Um, there are minerals that I mean, there's asbestos, mercury, and radiation in our minerals, in some of our minerals, um, all the taxidermy, uh, you know, obviously a natural history museum has many, many things that are um, hazardous in a fire. And so that is the, the end of my visuals. Uh, a few takeaways that I have for you. Um, there is no one size fits all um, first responder guide. It's definitely very specific to, to your site, um, what you want first responders to know. It has to be tailored to the needs of your building and collections. And once again, I cannot overstate the importance of the site visits with your local first responders. Um, I would recommend keeping in contact with them, have them back to your institution every couple of years. Um, their staff turns over, your staff turns over, things might change at your institution. Um, especially if you have construction projects going on, it's good to bring them back in during those times. Um, and then also uh, one thing that was a great benefit for us is going through the process of creating this guide really helped us be much better prepared to respond in a crisis. Um, we had a plan, we knew what to do, we knew whose role was what. And that is all I have. And so I will pass you on to Jordan. Thanks, Lynn. I'm going to be talking about something a little different before we jump back to a disaster with Amy. Um, and I'm going to share um, share my screen. There we go. Okay. 
Um, oh, sorry. Okay. So I'm talking about the Friends Historical Library, or FHL as we call it, and how we've gone about creating relationships and working with building managers. So I've been working at Swarthmore since 2019, and what I'm talking about today is an ongoing and evolving situation. Um, watch this space. My way of working with building managers isn't the only way or the right way, but it's working here at Swarthmore right now. Um, and I'm really happy to share my experience. And if you can adapt or borrow bits that fit your needs, I call that a win. So the background for the Friends Historical Library is that our manuscript book and image collections are stored below ground level in a 1968 building that was never really fit for purpose. And Amy's gonna talk more about that too. I'm just gonna flip through a few images of McCabe Library while I give you an idea of why our relationships with facilities and building managers are essential for the preservation of the collections. So I just, that's, that's our basement storage, the floor plan in the bedrock. Um, and an arrow pointing to our problematic corner, which we call the rainy corner. Um, to start, I keep in mind that we all, facilities, special collections, have a shared goal, and that's managing the storage environment. Doing so for special collection storage is different, maybe more demanding for facilities than maintaining dorms or classroom buildings, and understanding the demands of our spaces seems to be always developing. Two factors to keep in mind. Um, one, for the most part, our colleagues in facilities generally have a better understanding of human requirements, which as we know, are quite different from collections requirements. And two, reacting to changes in the storage environment in response to weather events um, creates an urgency, um, as well as the various challenges. Spoiler alert for Amy's talk, leaks, small floods in the basement, humidity spikes. Um, but I like to keep in mind the old cliche that this is a marathon, not a sprint, even though we have to sprint to keep up with the disasters. Um, there's just a little background to McCabe's construction. So the basis for creating and maintaining relationships with building managers is a lot like Lynn talked about with first responders, communication. And that works best, we found here, if you keep the number of people in contact with facilities limited. Your messages should generally come from maybe one to three library staff members. So plan with your colleagues ahead of time. Um, just a little more about the building. That's another spoiler alert for Amy's. Um, another point of communication is talking about the collections, um, which Lynn already mentioned. Um, but in talking about collections with facilities, uh, we make them tangible and important to everybody with the hope of justifying the little, that, that extra effort spent on the storage environment. So if I happen to focus on the oldest item in FHL, 1574, or a particularly well-known name, Albert Einstein, um, then I do it for the good of the rest of the collection, which is more recent than 1574 and was not created by Nobel laureates. Um, and that is the, the plan with the basement storage right there. So outside of talking and emailing, there are some project-based actions that have worked at Swarthmore. The first is working together to monitor conditions, both as library staff and with facilities. If you have the capacity, I recommend purchasing your own monitors and data loggers. Um, facilities may have their own data loggers, but having your own not only allows you um, to monitor your own conditions. It allows you to share that information and alert facilities to changes they not, may not be paying attention to. So in McCabe Library, we used older PEM2 data loggers from Amy's past project, another spoiler alert, and we also picked up some cheap relative humidity meters. Um, these aren't necessarily the most accurate, but they did alert us to swings in the conditions. Um, so building on from this basic monitoring, we have just purchased, oh, there's our storage again. We've just purchased a couple dozen onset hobo data loggers, and we'll be using these with eClimate Notebook, the software package that tracks data to measure the impact of environmental conditions on our collections and allow us to monitor risk of deterioration. And that is what eClimate Notebook is going to let us do. Um, in addition to that, I've managed to insert myself into most visits from facilities in the past two years, tagging along uninvited and definitely eavesdropping. Um, this has started to lead to invitations to take part in tours with contractors 
and the general expectation that I want to be involved. So on top of my personal relationship with facilities, a lot has happened due to the realization of the impact of years of deferred maintenance. Um, again, spoiler for Amy, um, multiple events, disasters, um, have led to shared concerns that have finally led to goal setting and action in the building. So one last thing I wanna talk about um, is a project we've just started in FHL and at the Swarthmore Libraries this month. And I'm hoping it's going to have an impact on our relationship with the building and with facilities. Um, through the Swarthmore College President's Sustainability Research Fellowship, um, FHL is gonna be hosting a student this year. We were matched with an engineering student who's gonna work with an advisory group and work with me to research, develop, and implement projects based on our storage. The project is entitled, as you can see, Sustain Sustainable Archives. And it's going to involve the fellow taking charge of the new data loggers and the data they produce. He's gonna come up with a plan to identify harmful microclimates in the building by looking at heat load, sources of moisture, other air flows. And depending on the findings, the fellow may recommend interventions to correct these issues. So while this is a really specific project about sustainability, it could be helpful in a number of other ways. Um, for example, two colleagues from facilities are going to serve on the advisor group for this project. So that increases my contact with them in situations that have nothing to do with mold, leaks, or other disasters. The fellow will also have time to refine how we monitor our collection storage and demonstrate impacts of the weather and changing climate on the building. And fellows from previous years have been invited to speak to college administrators and the board of managers. So this is a path potentially to funding that can improve our current storage or maybe even lead to newly built storage. So just to conclude, um, nothing I've talked about today is magic. Uh, like some of you, we're dealing with a problematic building. Um, in this case, one nicknamed the Colander by facilities. Um, we're doing our best to preserve our unique collections. I'm trying very hard to learn about HVAC and environmental monitoring while doing everything else my job entails. And I know I can't do this alone and that I'm relying on our building managers. But through some work that we've done, they're also relying on us now. So maybe my advice is to do what you can to make the relationships with facility staff as symbiotic as possible. Show them that what you're doing to improve your storage conditions and maybe even invite them to take part in other projects. And that is where I hand over to Amy. Thanks, Jordan. I appreciate it. Um, and I am going to talk about um, a situation that happened because of all of the issues that, that Jordan described. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. I think I've got it. Okay. All right. Um, I apologize if some of you may have seen this presentation, a similar presentation um, last year at the annual meeting. Um, I have a few little updates to it now. So hopefully, um, and actually some positive updates. So um, I hope that that will inform some of what you do. So my, my talk is the Swarthmore College Library's Rare Book Room and Facilities, a Relationship in Progress. Um, this is McCabe Library. As Jordan said, it was built, finished in 1968. Um, and you can see our lovely narrow little windows that do not open um, and our very fortress-like facade. Oops. There we go. Oh, whoops, I skipped ahead, sorry. <laughs> so here are some facts. Um, McCabe Library, as Jordan said, was built in 68. The H HVAC system basically stopped working, um, as was told to me by um, somebody who had worked um, in the HVAC system for a very long time, the very next year in 1969. Um, and nothing really was done to address that problem. Uh, there are four air handling units in McCabe and they're all zoned for different parts of the building. Of course, a rare book room is on the top floor of McCabe. And Jordan said, you know, the, a lot of the archives are in the basement, rare books are on the top floor. Um, and it's underneath what they call the penthouse, which is kind of hilarious because it's a big mechanical room with very old, scary looking um, 
uh, me mechanical things, <laughs> all different things. Um, I've been up there quite a bit and it's it's quite impressive. There are about 23,000 items stored in the rare book room and it includes everything from rare books, um, a growing fine press and artist book collection, pulp magazines, broadsides, um, collections of Wordsworth, Thompson, Auden, Michener. Um, it's just a sort of a mishmash and a lot of our rare books came to us through donation. I don't know why I'm not, okay, sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I'm skipping ahead so much. I'm hitting it once. Um, we, as a result of all of these ongoing problems that we've had with water in our building, um, in 2011-2012, uh, we had an NEH preservation grant um, and we looked at specifically the special collection spaces. So the Rare Book Room, Friends Historical Library, and the Peace Collection. We contracted with the Image Permanence Institute located at RIT as our consultants, um, and we purchased earlier versions of the same data loggers that we just got, and eClimate Notebook, which is still called that, um, software to track all of the conditions in these areas. Um, the good thing about this was that uh, the consultant and I worked really closely with um, uh, the person in our facilities department who was the HVAC specialist, um, now retired. But that was a really good first foray into a situation where we were working closely with facilities and they were actually learning from us, um, you know, how these environmental conditions are impacting our collections in a very negative way. Um, and one of the major findings of this report was that people in collections sharing space is not a great idea. Um, and all of, almost nearly all of our collection spaces, well, the, the rare book room is sort of separate, but we did have people who were working in that room for many, many years. Um, and, you know, the, the problem had been that you can't you can't satisfy both um, both people and the collections and and do them um, a service that's going to continue their longevity. So what happened was um, <laughs> they didn't really no one really read this report that came out of this and was very frustrating. Um, I mean, obviously the the person that I worked with closely in facilities did read the report, but I don't think anybody else in the college did. I don't think the head of facilities read it. I don't think anybody higher up read it. Uh, it was a really well written and well put together report um, that the consultant had largely um, done for us. And so that led to the great mold bloom of 21. <laughs> um, so the situation was that humidity levels rose up to 83% in the rare book room in August of 2021. I sent an urgent message to our facilities department at that point, um, stressing to them that there was going to be a mold bloom imminently if they didn't do anything about it. Their monitoring software was down um, and the person who was responsible for monitoring uh, conditions was on vacation. And I guess nobody was the backup. Um, so that was not great. September 13th, there was a full-blown active mold bloom in the rare book room. Um, the at that point, the facilities department did respond by installing two industrial dehumidifiers, um, but it was really too late to address the mold bloom. Once it started, that was it. Um, I think once the college realized how, how important this was and how disastrous it could be, they got everybody on board. So our OSHA rep on campus, the two co-VPs of finance at the time, the provost and the vice president for facilities were all involved in um, addressing the problem and then dealing with the insurance claiming process. But I was largely in charge of contacting the re remediation companies um, and also um, we needed to move all the materials out after remediation to address some of the issues in the room. So I also had to contact potential moving companies and our offsite storage facility. Um, we contract um, with a, another university for storage space, get all the quotes, make the arrangements for all of those steps. And that took a great deal of my time um, at the, at the time um, to investigate. And it was also complicated by the fact that this mold bloom happened right after the big flood that happened in Philadelphia where 676 was underwater, if you all remember that. Um, so all of the remediation companies were booked solid. I mean, they they were all dealing with the same issues um, in institutions and in people's homes. So it, it took a while before we could get a remediation team to come in. It wasn't until October, like mid-October. 
So here's some of the lovely pictures of the mold in the rare book room. It seemed to attack the cloth bindings um, pretty badly. We were lucky that it didn't attack um, other bindings, but it was not great. <laughs> so yeah, we'll see some of these others. That one was really scary. <laughs> So I continued to be the main contact between the libraries and we we ended up contracting with Belfour um, and who were, I have to say, pretty amazing. They came out with a team of 10 people um, in a fairly small space um, and they were there for eight days for like 10 hour days um, and, and remediated every single item in the room, um, including all the surfaces, the glass, everything. Um, so once they were done, uh, we contracted with Iron Mountain um, to move the collections to our offsite storage, which had its own issues. And I won't go into that because that's not the under discussion today. Um, it, it turned out okay in the end, but it was it was challenging. Um, the next steps at the college were to do an envelope study of McCabe, which was long overdue, um, and to try to address these infiltration um problems that have been going on for a long time. Um, we did do a major renovation of the HVAC system, um, which included um, a new unit for um, the rare book room, uh, which unfortunately um, still doesn't really address the humidity levels. Um, it's much better at addressing the temperature levels, it, and it's always cold in that room but the humidity levels continue to be not as high, but a little bit on the high side. So that's another ongoing conversation that we're having with them, but at least they understand. I, I think I've sent to them about six times what the level should be. <laughs> I think it's finally, finally sunk in that they understand where it should be. Um, so here, just to give the good news, here's what the same books look like after the remediation. So it is possible to get through a mold bloom and come back with books that are not destroyed. Um, they did a, a really wonderful job of cleaning up our collections. So the libraries and facilities going forward, um, even though it took a mold bloom to get their attention, um, I feel like our communication with facilities is a lot stronger than it had been in the past. Um, they really do listen to us. We have um, somebody who we contact first, usually if there's any issue, and she is the one who reaches out to all the right people to get things moving, and she really gets it. She, she gets that this is important. We need to do something right now. Um, so that is a really good thing. We have a new newish library director. She's been here for a year now, um, who is just in the beginning stages of planning for a major renovation or maybe even a new library building. And everybody is aware that HVAC and building envelope issues are on the list of concerns. Um, and so while we do have some lingering issues um, with humidity and a little bit of water infiltration, we're really hoping that keeping the lines of communication open will achieve lasting solutions. And I, I really feel like Jordan's work um, in getting on um, the president's sustainability uh, group is, is really going to be vital um, and help us in, a, in many ways to um, keep this forefront in the administrators' minds and the facilities department's mind. So lessons learned and my final thoughts, educate your administrators and facilities department about any of your environmental concerns, have the data lined up if possible, take lots of photos, buy reliable data loggers, um, to, as Jordan mentioned, to collect the temp and humidity measurements. And I, I agree with Jordan that we, you should buy your own. Um, facilities may provide some, but I think having your own that are actually um, geared to library collections is really important. Try to develop those good relationships with the facility staff and communicate regularly about any concerns and make sure you document all of those interactions. That came in very handy for me as well. And if possible, get your director, whoever runs your organization to communicate these concerns at the highest levels of administration in your organization, just to bring more attention to those issues and keep them in the minds of everybody at the top. And that is it, thank you so much. Thank you, Amy. Thanks to Jordan. And thanks to Lynn 
Uh, my name is Beth Lander. I'm the managing director of Paxcal, uh, and I am grateful that all three of these folks shared experiences of horror and frustration that I'm sure many folks here have also experienced. Um, I'm going to open things up for uh, Q&A. I cannot see all of you on the screen. Um, so I'm not certain if it would be easier to post questions in chat. So I'll open it up for questions. Actually, I have a first question. I'm gonna give it to Lynn. Lynn, I know this goes back to 2009, but how did you generate your maps? Um, <clears throat> the maps are from our, um, uh, our uh, HABS report. Historic Building Survey. Good idea. Um, and our site manager just wrote on the maps, so they're they're not a uh, they're nothing fancy. <laughs> so Kat Catherine Haas has another question for you, Lynn. How do you mm -hmm. set up a walk walk through with your first responders? Um. Well. Uh. For the police, it's easy for us because they're across the street um, and they actually ask us to do a lot for them. So we have a continuing relationship with them. The fire department, it's just figuring out which engine house is closest to you. There's usually one, you know, within a very short block radius of where you are in the city. Um, and so just uh, call up that that engine house and say, hey, you know, we're a cultural institution in your area and we'd like to, you know, introduce you to our site and give you some information for potential um, emergency calls. And there they, have always been uh, super responsive, so. Anyone else have any other questions? Bruce Bumbarger. Yeah, I was just gonna uh, agree with the importance of knowing your facilities people and also if you have a safety or security department, because um, the fellow who is head of safety for Haverford um, is a longtime volunteer fireman and kind of lives and breathes things having to do with fire. And so he's been very helpful um, in terms of um, getting us connected to and, and making sure that there is a, a regular walkthrough with the local fire department. Um, and then the other thing, um, Belfour is in my experience great and um, we've used them maybe four or five times once for a relatively uh, a kind of a medium-sized mold cleanup in one of our libraries they've worked on different water problems we've had and just recently um, I redid our um, emergency response manual and had a uh, couple of fellows from Belfour come out and they walked through um, our main library, the science library and the music library and familiarize themselves with all three facilities and what they might run into. And they'll also set up a system. There's a, a paid contract, which they actually didn't try to push. Um, and then just a kind of a, a regularization of um, a relationship so that supposedly, and we haven't had to put this to test, but um, supposedly in the event that there is kind of an area-wide problem where you might have a number of different institutions calling on their services, they say that they'll kind of put you to the top of the list or a little bit closer to the top of the list. And it also gives them the opportunity to familiarize themselves with 
who they might be dealing with in the event of an emergency. So they know that, you know, they can come to me, they can come to see Terry, that kind of thing, without having to go through that whole process of setting things up when things are kind of falling apart. So, and they're really responsive. So anyway. Thanks for that. That's great information. Uh, Lynn Bettina Hess has a question. Did you give the disaster plan to the first responders ahead of time? Yeah, when they came for the walkthrough. Um, so yeah, we reach out, make contact with the police department and the fire department and set up um, individual walkthroughs. Um, and then at that time, give them the first responders kit. Um, and that's why it's also important to do that every couple of years, because you might have updates to the first responder kit. It reminds them that they have it. Um, there's, it's not, it's rare that they would remember to grab the first responders kit on their way out the door in an emergency, um, which is another reason why the walkthrough is incredibly important and maintaining the relationship so that they have in their minds um, the layout of your site and uh, what, you know, what they need to know. But yeah, they have it in advance. Does anyone else have any other questions? And Bettina says, thanks. Anyone else? No one else has like a disaster on their mind. Well, if not, we will wrap up a little bit early. I want to thank Lynn Dorwalt, Amy McCall, and Jordan Landis for sharing their time um, and their experiences. And I want to thank all of you for coming. This is the first program in uh, uh, Paxical's Disaster Response Working Group and Program Committee series on, on dealing with various types of disaster. Uh, we will have um, an active shooter training coming up in, in January at the Free Library, which will be open first to staff of Paxical member institutions. Um, and then we'll have another program on who, how folks dealt with terrible things in May with Michael Norris from Carpenters Hall talking about the uh, Christmas fire of last year. Um, and folks from the University of Arts talking about how they dealt with the flood, with, with a flood. And more importantly, beyond the immediate response, how did they deal with it? And Bruce has his hand raised. Well, I would just say, I think it was Amy who talked about kind of chasing temperature and humidity levels and so on. And I just say that um, if that happens, don't give up because we had um, 2019, our new library facility opened up and we had both our secure storage space and our gallery space um, and the gallery space in particular was always frigid and the relative humidity as a result was always high and it took forever of having our guys come in, having the contractor come in and so on. And the um, person who finally kind of um, uh, solved the whole thing was just a technician who was in there and was poking around, doing various things, and just found evidences of people who had done things wrong and hooked something up incorrectly. And so you can sit there and keep on analyzing all the stuff that you're looking at, and it doesn't make any sense because something inside the machine is not working right. And so if you run into that situation, just keep poking at it. Um, and eventually, hopefully, somebody solves it. I'm really glad you said that, Bruce, because I'm going to talk to you <laughs> privately afterwards and, and uh, pick your brain about that, because that's kind of the situation we have now where they think cold is going to solve all the problems, but it doesn't. It doesn't. It really makes it know? worse. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. Well, thanks, everyone, for coming.
Uh, the recording will be up on PAC School's YouTube channel in a few weeks. And I will also send it to everybody who registered for this program. Um, thank you all. Have a great day and best wishes for nothing bad happening. Bye-bye.